so the syllabus is um, longer than usual uh, because it has a lot of um, you know things that have to be in there for online uh, classes so um, you'll see other you know usually you would have a course outline like uh, sections that uh, will cover um, how the grades are administered so we're going to have three exams uh, two midterms and one uh, final all of them in class and then uh, weekly homework more or less weekly um, for you submitted in class um, the online students would submit it online and um, this is the grading scale and again you have a calendar here with drop date and everything holidays and again a lot of information please go through that um, it's mostly for online students but you know uh, and technical and software agreements and things that have to be there for that purpose okay as I was saying I will use um, one note so what I will do will be to, you know, maybe build the course a little bit before, but not too much. So I would still want to give you an in-class feeling, so I still want to write everything. It's not that I'm going to throw some uh, slides up there and, you know, you're on your own. No, so I still want to write. I'll write on this rather than on the board, but that's pretty much the only, the only difference. I might even write slower here until I get used to it, so that I don't know yet. Um, so do you have any questions? No? Okay. okay. So we'll start with chapter one, uh, vector spaces. Uh, first section uh, introduction is mostly about vectors. You should have probably seen this before, right? Um, no, vectors maybe. <laughs> okay, so I'll quickly go through the first section just to remind you a couple of things. So let's start with a parallelogram law. That is the law for uh, vector addition, right? So let's just say that x and y are two vectors starting point P. Okay, so is that legible enough? Okay, so you have this point here, and two vectors, x and y. Uh, the parallelogram law tells you how to um, find their sum, you just draw a parallelogram. And here it is, right? The main diagonal there would represent the sum of the uh, two vectors. Now, uh, two vectors are uh, called parallel if x equals c times y uh, for some real number, uh, non zero real number t. If x equals t y for some uh, non-zero real number t, then x and y are called parallel. Um, 
Let me get rid of this so task bar. Okay, so now uh, what kind of operations can you do with two vectors? You have uh, vector addition, right, or difference, and scalar multiplication. Uh, vector addition is done with the parallelogram law, but if you think about a Cartesian plane, you can also add them by looking at the two coordinates, right, of the vector. So, um, for example, if x is, let's say, a1, b1, and y is a2, b2. All right, so on a Cartesian So let's say this is X. And then that's Y. Then it's very easy to uh, figure out the vector x plus y, right? You just add them entry-wise. And the other operation that I was talking about, scalar multiplication. So what happens to a vector if you multiply by a scalar? What does it turn into? Well, it depends on the scalar, right? If I multiply a vector by a positive scalar, it's going to be the same vector with a different magnitude, right? If the scalar is negative, though, what happens? It turns the other way around, right? So it changes direction, but the um, property about the magnitude stays, right, in the opposite direction. All right, so here are the properties of... Um, of those two operations with uh, vectors, you have them in the book as well. So, the uh, first one says that vector addition is commutative, right? So, x plus y equals y plus x. Okay, so vector addition is commutative. Uh, property number two, vector addition is associative. x plus y plus z could be done pretty much in any way. Uh, property three, there exists a zero vector, uh, which has the property that doesn't change anything, right? So x plus zero equals x for every vector x. Property four, for every vector x, there is a vector y such that x plus y equals zero. Who would that vector be? The inverse, which is just the original vector, but same magnitude, right? But going backward, like going in the opposite direction. Uh, every vector x, when multiplied by the scalar 1, nothing is changed, clearly. And then uh, multiplication by scalars is well behaved with respect to vectors, if you want, like in the sense of property 6 that the operation of scalar multiplication is associative in that sense. And then uh, according to properties 7 and 8, uh, scalar multiplication also distributes over uh, vector, uh, vector addition here to the end scalar addition you know, distributes over scalar multiplication for vectors. So everything is well behaved, if you want, you know, from this point of view. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. 
Oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Sorry. C times X is not that, right? But I like to delete with this thing, so. C1 is good too. That's good to All right, move on. All right, next topic in this first section, equation of a line um, through two points, A and B. So um, let's say A and B are here, it's two points. And this is the origin. We're going to create two vectors, one pointing towards A and one pointing towards B. So what I want to do is to join the two points. Pick a point X on that line and figure out the formula for the placement of that, of that X. This will be done depending on those two vectors, let's call them U and B, uh, the one from the origin pointing towards A and the one from the origin pointing towards B. So this vector from A to B, this one here that is dotted, um, let me call that um, W. Can you tell me uh, what W in terms of U and B? B minus U, correct. Uh, why is that? Well, you can imagine that this one here is negative u, correct? Point of direction. So now if I'm using that parallelogram law here uh, with b and negative u, right? If I imagine adding them up, vector. But that doesn't say b. Okay. So w is v minus u. Okay, what I want to figure out is this. From the origin pointing to that arbitrary point X on the line from A to B, I'm going to call the point X, but also the vector X, same, uh, same notation. Now, in order to figure out what this vector is, it clearly depends on the position of X, right? On that, that so it would, be really helpful to know what this is, this vector, right, from A to X. Now, again, it depends on the position of X, but what I know for sure is that AX, that vector, will be a scalar multiple of the vector W, right? Because it has the same direction, only a different magnitude. Okay, so I'm going to... Let me use some of those fancy things here. Since I have them. All right, so this one here, the red one, is going to be a scalar multiple, so t times w. Uh, for some non zero real number. Okay. So what is x then as a vector? So from the origin pointing towards that point x. You don't see where I'm pointing, do you? That's too bad. 
<laughs> okay, so I know uh, two vectors, right? I know OA and I know AX. How do I figure out the square root side of that triangle? T times W. U plus T times, correct, because T times W that you have up here is the same if you want as this one, right? I can transfer it down here so it could become some kind of parallelogram, right, with um, o OX is diagonal, so the sum. Okay, so um, X equals U plus T W or W we said is V minus U. So U plus T times V minus U where T is a real number. And you're going to see, uh, you know, just immediate like, applications of this in the book. So you will be given, you know, specifically given the vectors with numerical values. You will be asked to find uh, the equation of a point on a line. Uh, do you think it's clear how that works, or should we look at an example? Okay, I'll look at an example if you don't say anything. Uh, so. For example, what you'll see in the book will be something like that. Find the equation line uh, through the points there's one of them a negative two four and B of coordinates negative five eight and one straightforward application of the idea above so um, the equation equation will just be the following so a 3 negative 2 4 is also the first vector right in r3 pointing towards uh, that point so 3 negative 2 4 plus p times p times what what is W now? So B minus A in, in, in the sense that you just entry wise, so it's going B times uh, negative eight, eight uh, 10 and negative. So let's move on. Equation of a plane uh, through three points, A, B, and C. Right? So you know that three points will always determine a plane. So sh there should be a way to figure out the equation of that plane. Uh, so let's say these are the points. And in the plane determined by the three points, uh, let me just consider. Let me just consider a point um, right, So P is in the plane.
in the plane uh, determined by the three points A, B, C. I'll just write it right here. All right, so how do we figure out an equation for this? So we know A, we know B, we know C, therefore we can figure out all those vectors, right, connecting them if necessary. So we can figure out this vector from A to B, let's call it U. Uh, we can also find this one from A to C, let's call it uh, B. What I would like to find is this one. from A to P, A being given, right? So that would um, allow us to find a vector P. Okay, so what I'm going to do is to try to create a parallelogram using the points A and P, such that the vector connect P becomes the diagonal of that parallelogram. Okay, so to, in order to do that, through the point P, I'm going to draw lines parallel first to the vector u and then to the vector v. And then take those in order to form a uh, Now clearly u and v uh, will not be uh, the sides of that parallelogram anymore, right? But what will the new sides be? Well, it depends basically on the position of P, right? How far away it is from A. However, uh, this side here uh, from A to B, the one that elongates from A to B, is going to just be a scalar multiple, right, of the vector U, and the other one uh, will be a scalar multiple of the vector V. Therefore, we can find a vector AP by adding, right, the two uh, multiples of the vectors. So, in conclusion, Uh, AP, well, I cannot just say SU plus TV, S and T being scalars, because A is not the origin, right? If A would have been the origin, I could have said that. So I'm going to say A plus that, right? Because I'm transferring everything to that vertex, A instead of the origin. So A plus SU plus TV. or some uh, real numbers and Okay. So uh, again, if you if you want to see a quick application of this. So straightforward application, uh, find a well, given A, B, and C. Uh, find the equation of an arbitrary point in that plane uh, determined by A, B, C. Basically, all you have to do is to apply the formula above, right? So x will just be a uh, plus s times, well, what is u? The connecting a to b, right? So I have to subtract them, so negative 2. Uh, 9 and 7, and then plus t uh, times the vector connecting a to c, so negative 5, 12 and 2. Okay, 
So most examples in this section in the book will just be like this, you know, just straightforward applications. It's just basically a review of vectors. Um, something may be a bit more challenging, I'll say, than this. Uh, would look like the following one. This is number six on page uh, six in the book. It says, show that the midpoint of the line Uh, segment joining the point of coordinates A, B, and C, D is given by the following. A plus C over 2 and B plus D over 2. It's in R2, so you can you know, easily figure out what's going on graphically, but let's take a look. So this is the first point. This is the second one. Let's say let's call this one A and that one B. And now join the two. And look at the midpoint. So the midpoint would have, let's say, coordinates E and F, right? We have to, to show that E has to be A plus C over 2 and F has to be B plus D over 2. Um, and I'm not talking here about geometrical approaches or anything, right? So I'm just trying to use vectors. So if I use vector for segment from A to B, knowing that M is the midpoint, I can look at it as the vector AM pointing in that direction having to be equal, right, to so the vector MP. They have the same magnitude and the same um, direction. So if I were to go ahead and write the vector AM, what would that be? Well, I would have to subtract them, right, using those E and F kind of notations. So AM would have to be E minus A, F minus B, right? And what about MB? Well, MB would be C minus E and D minus F, right? Those two vectors, I would want them to be the same, right? To be equal. Uh, and that would mean that E minus A equals C minus E and F minus B equals D minus F. And if you solve for E and F, you're going to get exactly what you need.
So this is the um, end of section one. This is maybe the most one of the most complicated examples that we've seen. I've seen in this section. So again, most of them are of this type above. Um, the one where you just plug in the numbers, and that's pretty much it. So um, the second example okay, was a bit more challenging. Okay. So I'll move to the second section. Um, if you, if you're okay, any questions? Okay. So we'll move to vectors. Uh, in order to talk about uh, vector spaces, we're going to need the notion of a field. Uh, and for that, I'll have to take you back a little bit to uh, abstract uh, algebra, right? So uh, let's try to remember. So in abstract algebra, a field was defined to be a commutative ring with unity, such that all the non-zero elements were units. Such that. Okay, so let's go through that a bit and make sure it still makes sense. So let's start with the idea of a ring. What was a ring? A ring is a set, let's call it R, together with two operations that are usually denoted by addition and uh, multiplication. Two operations means it's closed under those two operations, right? So when you add two things in R, you still land in R, and when you multiply them, it's still in R, right? So closed under the two operations, such that under the first operation, so the first operation is the nicer one, addition. Under the first operation, the set becomes an abelian group. So addition is commutative, right, to be a billion. And then to be a group, what does it mean? It has an identity, which we're going to call a zero because we the operation, since it's denoted by plus, right, if you think about real numbers, the identity with respect to addition is zero, right? So we're going to call this identity a zero. And what else to be a group? Every element must have an inverse, right, under addition, right? With this operation. So, a billion group. Um, multiplication, well, not much is required about multiplication. It has to be closed, of course, under multiplication, but it has to be well behaved with respect to addition, so it has to distribute. And also, it has to be associative. So, multiplication has this kind of property. And multiplication, again, has to distribute with respect to addition, which means something like this on both sides. So all this gives the definition of a ring. Now, 
To be commutative, what does it mean? I'm afraid I cannot go down anymore, so I'll go to the right. Okay, so we have a ring here, right? I want it to be commutative. What does it mean to be commutative? Under addition, it's automatically commutative. It has to be by definition. So when that thing is added in front of a ring, it means with respect to multiplication, it has to be commutative. So this commutative thing here means it is commutative with respect to multiplication, right? So the second operation is uh, commutative. What does it mean to have a unity? A one, where one is, what, what is a one? Is an identity with respect to multiplication. It already has one with respect to addition, right? Zero is always in there, because it's a group, but one, unity. All those extra conditions are all about multiplication, usually, because that's the one that is not well behaved, right? Addition is the nicer one. Okay, and lastly, all non-zero elements must be units. What is a unit? A unit is an element that is invertible with respect to multiplication. So they are all invertible with respect to addition, that's not a problem, but multiplication could or, well, you know, may or may not be. So, units. Okay. Let's look at some examples to make sure we understand this. Let's start with one of the nicest set of numbers, integers. On the set of integers, um, I can talk about addition of integers, right? And multiplication of integers. Okay, so I have a set and I have two operations. Now I'm wondering if this thing is first a ring and secondly, what I need, what I'm interested in here, a field. Okay, so to be a ring again, Z under addition should be an abelian group. Is Z under addition an abelian group? Yes, there is a zero in there, and every integer has its negative, right, such that when you add them, you get zero. So it, it works perfectly fine. Okay, a multiplication of integers, is that associative? Definitely, okay. Now, what about this? Does multiplication distribute over addition? Sure, it does. Okay, so this one here is definitely a ring. But let's work through the properties of a field now, right? Is it a commutative ring? Z. In other words, multiplication on Z, is that commutative? Yes, when you multiply two integers, it doesn't matter, right, in which order you do that. So it is a commutative ring. Does it have a unity? With respect to multiplication in Z, you can always multiply by one and nothing changes, right? So it is a commutative ring. It has a unity which is one, right, the integer one. What about the units? Well, not really working, right, because, for instance, number two is a non-zero integer, right? 
But if this would be invertible with respect to multiplication, that would mean I would need to have a number such that this holds. And that number would have to be one half, clearly, right? So since one half is not in Z, two is not invertible. It's not a, yeah, it's not invertible. So two is not a unit. So what's the conclusion, Mr. Phil? No. Okay. Now some good examples of fields and the ones that most of the times we'll use here in this course are real numbers and complex numbers. Those are both fields. <clears throat> Let's see why. Well, Everything holds as before, right, with Z. The difference is now that here, one half that created a problem before, now exists in both R and C, right? So every non-zero element in R or C will have an inverse, and that will turn them into fields. So, uh, of course, there are more, you know, a lot more examples of fields, but that's not really the... The purpose right, of this course. So if you want to, if you need to, to read more about them, there is an appendix in the book. It's appendix C. It's all about uh, fields if you need more examples or practice. But anyways, I'll put an exclamation mark here. Those are the two that will use real and uh, complex numbers. All right, so now that we know what the field is, uh, let's talk about uh, vector spaces. Very, very long definition of a vector space. So, a vector space, V. You're talking about, first of all, a vector space over a field. So they come together, right? A set V and the field F, which again, Keep in the back of your mind that those are real numbers or complex numbers if necessary. Okay, but let's just think about reals in general. So you have uh, a set V with two operations. Okay, the operations are addition and scalar multiplication. I'm kind of following now the properties that vectors had in the previous section. Remember that long list of properties like vector addition is commutative, there is a zero vector, there is an inverse vector with respect to addition and all that. These are the properties, exactly the same ones. So we could take two elements, x and y and v, there is a unique sum. Again, think about the elements of v as vectors, only that this setting is abstract now, right? But you're allowed, you know, to think in your head of them as being vectors. So the sum of two vectors, right, is still a vector. And then a vector times a scalar, only that the scalar now belongs to this abstract notion of a field, right? But still, it is being R. So a vector times a scalar is, again, a unique element in there, so a unique vector. So such that the following conditions hold. Addition is commutative. Yes, we knew that, right? Vector addition was commutative. Addition is associative, as you know, something that uh, holds for vectors as well. There exists an element in V denoted by zero that doesn't change anything, right, under addition. Um, for every element X in V, there exists an element Y that is this kind of inverse with respect to addition. And then remember when you multiply a vector by a scalar, you can you have this kind of property. Multiplication distributes 
in that way and in this way. Right? So you're copying basically the eight properties that vectors have, but we're making them into a very um, general setting, let's say, right? So a formal setting now. We'll still call, um, so the elements X and Y uh, will be uh, called vectors. Are still called vectors, so every element in V is still called a vector, although it may not be a vector in the standard sense that you're used to, right? But it's an abstract type of vector. Um, and the elements of the field are, are called scalars still. Okay. All right, so now let's look at some examples of uh, vector spaces. First example, let's start with a field. Can, uh, you can um, think of real numbers or complex numbers. And to construct now um, a vector space like this. So we're going to take an n tuple with all entries in that field F, so something like this. So all the N entries are from the field And we're going to collect all these n tuples into a set, call that f to the n. The set containing all the n tuples with entries in that field. All right, so this set now will be our vector space, but to turning it to turn it into a vector space, I need two operations, right? I need addition and I need scalar multiplication. So I need to specify how these n tuples can be added to each other, or how can they be multiplied by a scalar, and it's done in the most natural way possible. Okay, so define on f n addition and scalar multiplication. So if you take two n tuples and add them, Again, uh, this is done in the most natural way possible. You're going to just use addition entry Y. And scalar multiplication, you find that naturally as well. Multiply every entry by that scalar. All right, so with these definitions, Fn becomes a vector space. Oh, 
over that field F that started everything. Okay, so the field F from the beginning. Right, so let's try to go through the uh, def, you know the properties in the definition of the vector space to figure out or understand why this is a vector space. So first of all, this set f to the n has to be closed under the two operations that we have. True? True, right? We still get n tuples by performing any of the two operations. Um, property one, addition should be commutative. Addition of n tuples, right, on fn, so, um, which is this one here. So why doesn't it matter in which order I add the two n tuples? Because if I add them backwards, what do I get here? Well, I get b1 plus a1 instead, right? And bn plus an. Is that the same thing? Why? They are in a field, and the field is in particular an abelian group under addition, right? It doesn't matter in which order you add them, so it makes perfect sense. It is the same thing. Okay, so addition of n tuples is commutative. Second property, addition of n tuples should be associative. It goes down to what? To being associative in every of the n entries, right? In the end of the n tuple. Should I write this down, or is clear what I'm talking about? Yeah, let me. Right. So addition is. Do you want to see commutativity as well, or just being associative? Commutative as well. Yeah. All right. So. All right, but let, let's start with property one. Addition is uh, commutative. So I take two n tuples, and I want to check that when I add them, it really doesn't matter in which order I do. So that's what I need uh, to check. Now, on the left side of this equality, I get the n tuple with entries a1 plus b1, a2 plus b2, a n plus b n. And this should be the same as the n tuple with entries b1 plus a1, b2 plus a2. So on bn plus a n. Now, um, when are two n tuples equal? When they are equal entry wise, right? So, in order for those two to be equal, we need that a i plus b i equals b i plus a i or all those i's between 1 and n. And that is clearly true because this happens, those are elements uh, of a field, and the field is commutative with respect to addition. So that's checking that addition is commutative. Checking that addition is associative. So 
So being associative, uh, we need to take three, right? Three entaples and add them up and see what happens. So A1, A2, AN, plus let's say I'm adding them up like this first, B1, B2, BN, and C1, C2, CN. This should be the same thing as A1, A2, AN plus B1, B2, BN and then plus C1, C2, C1. So now the, the thing on or the thing above is equal to what? What n tuple does this? So I need to show first entry will be a1 plus b1 plus c1 added like this. And then a2 plus b2 plus c2 and so on. And this should equal, on the other side, A1 plus B1 plus C1, A2 plus B2 plus C2, AN plus BN plus CN. Right? which reduces again to AI plus BI plus CI should equal this. And that's something that holds again because we are in a field and addition being a group under addition has to be associated. Checking all those eight properties will kind of be like this. Uh, a lot of writing, pretty much straight. Um, so I'll try to skip through some, some of them if you allow me. So this was property two. Uh, property three actually is not going to take too long. I can write that. Property three says uh, there exists a zero such that x plus 0 equals x, where x is an n tuple now, right? So what is the 0? The 0 n tuples, so 0 Now, there will be confusion regarding to is that a bigger zero or a smaller zero or what does that zero represent each of those n and not only in this setting in general in vector spaces um, each of those n zeros that you see here are zeros as scalars in the field real numbers if you want to think about them like this this zero here which in the book i think if i remember correctly is like this bigger, maybe a bold side, you know, of a zero. This means zero is a vector, which our vectors are n tuples here. But in general, in any vector space V, you will have the zero scalar of the field and the zero vector in the vector space. You need to be able to distinguish between the two. And in general, you'll distinguish even without, you know, writing them differently just by looking at the setting. So am I talking about the vector now? Then it's a zero vector. Are they talking about the scalar? Then it's the number zero or the scalar zero. But I'll try to, you know, distinguish between the two. I, you know, like a bigger zero or a bolder zero or something. All right. 
right, property three was this one, property four. Every vector has an inverse with respect to addition. So for an n tuple, a1, a2, a n, what would be the inverse? Negative in every entry card. So negative a1, negative a2, negative a n. And the addition of those two will give you the n tuple with all zeros, so the zero vector of this um, vector space, what will be a vector space. Uh, property five. Says that one times a vector equals the vector. One is one, right? If you multiply an n tuple by one, it automatically gives you one, so that is trivially satisfying. Six. If A and B are in the field, then multiplication by scalars satisfies this property. where x is an n tuple. Is it clear why it's like that? It's again going down to entry-wise being like that, right? Exactly like we proved properties uh, 1 and 2. In the exact same way you can show this one if you replace x by a1, comma a2, comma a n. And, you know, it's going to be straightforward, right? Seven. What about this? A is supposed to be a scalar, so something in the field. X and Y are, in our case, n tuples. Right, the B that I was talking about, where is it? Is it clear again how this holds? Again, down to checking this entry wise, and that is satisfied for the field. And finally, property eight, very similar. For two scalars A and B now, and n tuple x. All right, let's uh, look at two examples from the book. Um, so I'm going to go now through a list of let's say, famous vector spaces, this is one of them, the n tuples. Um, then we'll look into matrices and polynomials, functions, continuous functions, you know, they all form their own vector spaces. But uh, just look at some examples, you know, based on n tuples. So page 15. Examples 14 and 15. Number 14 on page 15 says the following thing. Let V be the set of n tuples. with entries in C, complex numbers,
So, and it continues like this. So V is a vector space over which field? C, right, because when we looked at this example here above, when we looked at this example, we constructed n tuples, right, with entries in a field F, and we proved that F to the n becomes a vector space over that F, right, that we used to build the n tuples. So now, if I go back here and I take all the entries in C, then I'm going to get a, a vector space over C. Now the question is, is this V a vector space over R? So I'm changing the field, right? I constructed the set like above. The set is given by n tuples over C. And I'm wondering is this, if this V is a vector space over the field R, together with the operations as they normally should be, addition of n tuples and scalar multiplication of n tuples. Addition is defined um, entry-wise, I said, or coordinate-wise. And multiplication by scalar the same way, right? So when you do C times or A times an n tuple, it's just A times every entry. And you know, let me just put the next one just to kind of see the difference, you know, to kind of grasp more, you know, what this question is about. 15 is backwards. So it says, uh, let V be the set of n tuples with entries in R. which according to the example above would become a vector space over the field R, right? Now the question is, is the a vector space over the field C? Again, addition and multiplication, scalar multiplication are defined um, coordinate ones. So one will have a problem, the other one will not have a problem, right? Can you see what's going on? Um, Inverses, can you can you say more? Well, let's, let's look at one of them and go through the properties, right, and see what happens. Which one do you like more, the first or the second? It doesn't matter, maybe. Okay, let me take the first one. Now, I want to go through the properties. So, think about it as being n tuples with complex numbers, right? 
But when I go to the properties, the field is R. So what does it mean that the field is R? When I do scalar multiplication, I'm only allowed to multiply by real numbers. Correct? That's pretty much it. So, going through the definition of the vector space. Okay. It has to be closed under addition. Right? If you add two n-tuples with complex entries, you get an n-tuple with complex entries. And multiplication by scalars. My scalars are real numbers. I'm talking about the first example now, right? My scalars are real numbers. I multiply an n-tuple over c by a real number. I'm still getting an n-tuple with complex entries, right? So it's closed under scalar multiplication. What about everything else? Um, well, if I look at properties, property one, addition of vector is commutative. I don't really care what the field is, right, for that property, so I can just go ahead and skip it. It doesn't matter if the field is C or R. I already know that it holds for the field being C. So, property two, addition of vectors is associative. Again, it, no, no connection to the field itself, so it doesn't matter if I change the field. It should hold. Property three, there exists a zero vector. Yeah, it's in there. Property four, every vector has an inverse with respect to addition. Again, independent has nothing to do with the field, so I don't care about that. I, I move on. Property five, there should be a one in the field. Yeah, one is in both C and R, so it really doesn't affect us, right? It still works. Property six, that's where you put a times b times x equals a times bx, where a and b are in the field. But does it really matter if those a and b are complex or real? It shouldn't, right? If it works for complex numbers, a and b, and it does work, right, for complex numbers, because it, it was supposed to be a vector space over c anyways. If I just restrict the scalars to real numbers, it's still trivially, right, implicitly satisfied, right? So properties 6, 7, and 8 of the definition, they, they work for any scalars in C, in particular, they will work for any scalars in R, correct? So do you agree with this? So the first one still holds, and um, Basically, the main reason is this. All those properties hold for complex scalars. They will have to hold for real scalars in particular. So it's just a restriction, if you want, right? You're looking at the, at the subset of C. Now, here is the opposite, right? Number 15. What seems to be the problem here? All right, so I don't even need to look into the eight properties. I'm just looking at the fact that scalar multiplication is not going to be, I mean, the set is not closed under multiplication by scalars when the field is C now, of course. So, no, B is not a vector space. C since uh, B is not closed under scalar multiplication with complex numbers. Right, so if I take an n-tuple with all real entries, I multiply by i, let's say, on the outside. When you distribute in there, you don't get an n-tuple anymore with real entries, right? So it's not closed, therefore it cannot be a vector space. This being said, it's going to be the end of the lecture if you have any questions. So we'll continue uh, next time with matrices as a vector space over a bit. Stop here.